But certainly, if uh, the Ottoman Empire had been fighting on the winning side, then uh, I don't think it would have collapsed in uh, 1918 through to 1923. Um, but it would have left unanswered questions, of course, because there was an increasing movement among the Arab peoples of the Ottoman Empire for um, at least something like um, home rule before the war. And who knows where that would have led afterwards. How much truth is there in the belief that, in fact, the Ottoman Empire <coughs> had possibly initially wanted to fight on the side of the Allies, but then had felt so let down by uh, Great Britain that it eventually chose the side of Germany and Austria-Hungary? I don't think there's any real truth in that at all, because um, who were the natural enemies of the Ottoman Empire? The greatest one was Russia. Uh, Russia, don't forget, uh, you know, wanted to have Istanbul, Constantinople, um, as well as large areas of eastern Anatolia. France and Britain might well have their own imperialist designs. And this is really why Ottom the Ottoman Empire became close to Germany, because Germany was a power that had no ambitions in the region. Uh, there had been an, you know, there was a very strong naval connection between Britain and the Ottoman Empire before the war. And of course, there was the whole question of the Ottoman warships that were being built in Britain and were suddenly impounded by the British government as hostilities with Germany began. That may have helped to push the Ottomans into the war, but I think the real reason, beyond any doubt, why, why the Ottomans came in on the German side was because Germany was a strong power, a friendly power as far as the Ottomans were concerned, while the other powers surrounding it uh, all of which had taken territory from the Ottomans at one stage or another, there were people the Ottomans would naturally have seen as a threat. What, in your opinion, were the main mistakes of the Sykes-Picot agreement, that secret agreement in 1916 between Britain and France that was going to carve up the Middle Eastern parts that were under rule of the Ottoman Empire? I think it's very hard to say what were the main mistakes of it. The whole thing was wrong in principle. It belonged to the world before the 1914-18 war when um, powers in Europe had thought we can, divide, we can draw lines on a map and divide up territories among ourselves. Uh, international law at the time allowed them to do that. One of the big changes during the First World War that was that international law ceased to allow countries to do that or at least not in such a blatant way as before. Um, and, you know, one can think of the, what were the negative consequences of Sykes-Picot? Um, of course, they, it led ultimately to the mandates. Um, it led to the splitting up of what was then known as Greater Syria in Arabic Bilad al-Sham, which stretched all the way from the Sinai Peninsula up to the borders of what is now modern Turkey. Um, the people of that area didn't want to be split up. They wanted to have a unified constitutional monarchy. There was a chance that that could have happened. And I think if it had happened, um, the Middle East would be a much less unstable place today. But it was frustrated by the ambition and, for want of a better word, the greed of Britain and France. Of course, Sykes-Picot also covered a large area of eastern Turkey. But uh, Mustafa Kemal, as he then was, Kemal Ataturk, was able to push the French out of that area. John, briefly, if you don't mind, and I realize that's even an unfair way of putting mm. it, but how much of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the problems it has today are due to World War I? Well, you can trace it back entirely to then. I mean, before the First World War, um, Arabs and, you know, or should we say Muslims, Christians and Jews, had lived together in relative harmony. Obviously, not everything was completely rosy in the garden, to use an English expression, but, you know, people rubbed along together. And under the, in the final decades of the Ottoman Empire, following the Tanzimat reforms, you did have a progress towards constitutional and secular governance. Now, they hadn't reached that, they hadn't achieved that, but it was on a path that they were going down. 
And what happened with the Balfour Declaration was that it had shattered that. I see the Balfour Declaration as one of a number of documents that brought, secular, that brought sectarianism and interreligious hatred and dispute into the Middle East where it had not existed before. And I think that is, again, something that lies at a lot of the instability in today's Middle East. As some commentators have said, the Balfour Declaration was the sowing of dragon's teeth. You know, you sow dragon's teeth and they spring up as armed soldiers who will then fight each other. But I'm very sad to say that that's what happened. And of course, it was my country, Great Britain, that uh, produced this document. Um, it conflicted, incidentally, with the covenant of the League of Nations, under which Britain had the Palestine mandate, because Article 22 of that covenant said that Britain had a sacred trust of civilization to look after the well-being and development of the Palestinian people, and, okay. to, and that meant to guide them to independence, and they reneged on that.